What I'd like to do now is continue on with the overview of Android components. And I think in the time remaining, we'll have a chance to get through one more. Um, this part of the discussion focuses on so-called content providers. And it also talks about broadcast receivers. And then it's also going to talk about um, uh, intents. We'll talk about intents later. The focus in all this stuff is really on, on things that are used for concurrency and communication, although this stuff is used for other stuff as well. You can, you can use uh, content providers without explicitly using any concurrency in your code if you so choose. There's mechanisms that are built into the frameworks that make that invisible to you for the most part. Once again, we'll also use the image download application to kind of make the points more concrete. Let's start by talking about content providers. So the key thing about content provider is it provides you with a way to access structured storage. So what is structured storage? Anybody want to hazard a guess as to what structured storage is? What does structured storage typically mean in this context? Maybe a better question is, what's unstructured storage? Robbie. Exactly. So basically, unstructured storage would be things like just files that have blob, blob bytes, like an image or something, which actually has a structure too. But from the point of view of the file system, it's just a blob of bytes. That's unstructured storage. Whereas structured storage is typically something stored in a database, often, though not always, in a table of some kind that you can index by key. And it has various rows, which are instances, and columns, which are basically fields. And you organize it. And you can do various relational operations to it, and so on and so forth. So content providers are typically used to manage access to structured storage by one or more applications. And so the basic idea here is that oftentimes you want to create data that multiple applications will access and use in various kinds of ways. Sometimes you just want to have it used by one application, but you still want to manage it in a very consistent and clean way. And we'll talk about why you would want to do that. So here's the basic format of a, of a content provider. As we'll see later, it's got a bunch of methods in it. We'll talk about those. And there's a way to be able to identify the content provider by various um, uniform resource identifiers. For example, uh, as we get further along in the course, we'll see an example where we have an image download application that uses a content provider to store certain information about images that have been downloaded. So the images themselves, the, the blobs, as, as Robbie called them, those are actually just stored as files. But then there's also metadata, data about the images that we might want to store. We might want to store the creation time for the image, for example. We might want to store the image type or the image size or some other properties about the image. And so those things could be stored as metadata in some kind of content provider. And we'll look at some examples of that later. There are also lots and lots of other examples of content providers that are used by all the packaged applications in Android. So things like the calendar, which is managing your, your events that you have on your phone. Uh, you have things like the contacts, of course. Your, your contacts list keeps track of all the information about people that you call on a regular basis, their, uh, their names, their phone numbers, their addresses, their emails, their pictures, their ringtone, you know, whatever it is, that stuff is stored in a content provider and so on. The browser stores a bunch of stuff relating to browser bookmarks, browser history. Those are stored as a content provider. Uh, MMS, SMS, the text messages you send back and forth, those are stored in a content provider and so on and so forth. The data can actually be stored many different ways. So you could have data stored as, as a file. You could have data stored in the cloud and so on. By far, the most common way of storing the data is in an SQLite database. And we'll talk a bit more about SQLite in just a second. That's by far the way it's done. And there's some good reasons for that. The main thing is that SQLite gives you a fairly lightweight implementation of the SQL mechanisms, which allow you to be able to have the so-called ACID properties, which allow the data to be sort of persisted. And you can retrieve it. You can version it, and so on. Um, they also allow you to do all the, the common so-called CRUD operations, which is to create uh, new elements, uh, read the elements, update the elements, and delete the elements. 
And so you see how those things get implemented here with the various methods that we'll talk about in, uh, in a minute. How do you implement a content provider? There's a bunch of steps involved, as usual. Uh, one thing you do is you start out by extending content provider, and then you go ahead and override a bunch of its CRUD methods. Um, so there's an onCreate method that's called to initialize the content provider. Insert is used to insert basically these uh, content values into the content provider. Query is basically the R. It's for reading the contents. And the thing you can do, of course, is when you query something, you can give SQL expressions. So you can do various kinds of SQL operations to, to query based on fields and filters and matches and so on. It's very, very powerful. You can sort the data in various ways by different fields. It's lots of things you can do. Uh, update basically replaces what's already there. And then delete is used to remove one or all elements or elements that match certain criteria based on filters and, and predicates and things like that. So these are all very powerful operations. We'll have a whole section on this stuff. And you'll hopefully get a chance to play around with it and write some things. And then you also go ahead and, and specify how you want the content provider to be exposed if you do want it exposed to the outside world. Sometimes it's perfectly OK just to define a private content provider. There's no intent on making it visible to anybody else except the one application that uses it. If you want to make an, a content provider that's available to multiple applications, of course, you have to describe it in your manifest file. And you do a bunch of things here. You give it a name. You indicate whether you want it to run a separate process or not. And you also give it something called its authority. And this is used to be able to identify a particular content provider. So you can think of this as basically kind of like a, a URL that resolves itself in the address space of the device as opposed to the address space of the internet. And we'll look at this a lot more later on. OK, uh, let's talk a little bit more about how you actually use content providers. Ironically, even though content providers are one of the four core components in the Android architecture, we don't actually access them directly. Content providers are always accessed indirectly via something called a content resolver. So if you go back to seeing the picture we had before, you have an application that accesses the contents of content providers using content resolvers. And the content resolvers are basically proxies that are used to give access to the contents in the content provider by client applications. So here's a very common way of using this. You would go into your application. You'd say, get content resolver which goes ahead. This is basically a factory method, sort of a built-in factory method that gets you the content resolver. And there's various ways of overloading and requesting the right content re resolver and so on. But this is the default way. You can make your own customized content resolvers if you want. But out of the box, you get back a proxy to the content provider through the content resolver. And then when you call operations on this, you have to pass in some information that will identify which content provider you're actually trying to get access to based on its authority. And we'll talk about this all much later on. You can kind of think of it sort of like opening a file. It's a little bit like opening a file. Or directing yourself to a particular website using a URL or something like that. Um, in fact, that's a very good way to look at it. And we'll see how that maps later onto the tables that are typically stored here. Does anybody know why Android separates content providers from content resolvers? What's, what's the reason for doing this? Lawrence. That's a, yeah, so basically the observation is you can get more flexibility by being able to share the content provider by different content resolvers. That, that's part of the reason. The real reason is it gives you more flexibility to be able to have the access to the content provider span address spaces or security domains and so on. And so it gives you some additional opportunities to, for checking in these things, for authenticating stuff, for giving you more flexibility on how you actually access it. So access to the content provider is somewhat separate from the way the content provider exposes its operations directly. You see there's also something interesting. I think it's called a client content provider that can be used to optimize access to the content provider. And we'll look at that later. That's a, another sort of short-circuited way of bypassing a per-request authentication mechanism. There's a nice article here at this website that talks about the differences between content resolvers and content providers and why there are content resolvers, what the purpose, what the purpose is and what purpose they serve in the Android architecture. 
There's another interesting thing that you get with uh, content resolvers and content providers. It's, it's the ability to automatically register to receive notifications when state in the content resolver or the content provider changes. Now, what does that sound like? If you think back to those of you who took 251, what does that sound like? What pattern is that? The observer. the observer pattern, right. So this is good old observer pattern. The observer pattern, as you may recall, allows you to define a one-to-many relationship between objects so that when one object changes state, an untold number of other objects can be notified automatically. Why would you ever use this mechanism? What would be the reason for wanting to use an observer-like style of, of a pattern in your architecture? What does it buy you? Put another way, what, if you didn't have an observer, how would a client find out something changed? It would pull, right? <laughs> It'd have to sit there and repeatedly say, has this value changed? Is this image been downloaded? Has this image been downloaded? Has this image been downloaded? Which would be painful to write and very inefficient to run. So instead, what you do is you as an application, typically an activity, but it could be other kinds of Android components as well, you can go ahead and register a content observer with the content resolver. And then when something happens here in the content provider, there's an API you can call that basically says notify observers. And that, call, that causes the Android system to call back on the onChange method. So you register a content observer, this is on the, the client side, you register a content observer here, um, and then this method gets called back later. So you can see here we, we registered this guy, and over here this is how it's defined, and when it, something happens, the onChange hook method gets automatically called back, and that gives you a chance to do something in response to that. Yes, sir? Yeah, if typical, the question was, what's the visibility right. of the on change method to other things that are going along in the context in which it's called? So all, all the typical um, scoping rules of Java apply here where you would need to be able to get access to, especially if you do it this way, you need to be able to get access to something that was defined in a scope that makes it visible there. And you might have to make it be final in order to be able to access it and all that kind of good stuff. So yeah, there, then there's many different ways to do this. This is just a shorthand that fits on one slide. But it's also a pretty common idiom. This is the anonymous inner class idiom you see a lot in Java, where we define a content observer that has a new handler. And then the onChange method is defined here. Notice we didn't explicitly say, uh, class my content observer extends content observer which was one thing we could have done. Instead, we define an anonymous inner class that has the onChange method overridden. Very, very common idiom you see used all over the place in Java and Android code when you just need an object that exists for a particular bounded amount of time. OK, so the benefit there is you get called back. And this is used quite a bit um, either directly like this, where you can have clients that register for updates when things change, or you actually have a whole mechanism that you can connect with uh, something called the loader manager and cursor loader, which we'll talk about much later in the course to access content provider information. Yeah. Oh, and then also these change observations, they're just to let you know something changed so that you can go and fetch it? Yes. Do they actually push it? Right. No, they just tell you something's changed. Um, and uh, let's say I was going to say something else about Oh, so some things that you know, might use this kind of mechanism would be something that, uh, you know, like an email application or an SMS application that wants to be notified uh, uh, when something has happened. If you're in the app and something changes out from underneath you, you want to be notified up automatically so you can update your, your view or something like that. Now, here's some important things to remember. Android does not synchronize access to content providers by default. The methods that are defined, the insert, query, update, delete, and so on, these are not synchronized at all. So if there's some reason why you need to make these things runnable 
in a multi-threaded program, you are responsible for doing the synchronization yourself. Uh, and if you don't, and there's a reason you need to, then you will have so-called race conditions occur. Race conditions are what happens when you have multiple threads accessing shared state that is not protected by synchronization mechanisms. And there's kind of a race to see which values are going to be overwritten by the other values in, an, in a non-synchronized or non-coherent way. So you have to decide the synchronization mechanism. Now, it turns out that oftentimes it depends on how you're accessing state. So if the create, query, update, and delete methods, the CRUD methods on a content provider actually don't access any shared state, then there's no need to put any locks in them, which is why they don't put locks in them by default. And the reason why it's often the case in practice that you don't need to put locks inside your content provider methods that you define is because most of the time they simply forward to the underlying SQL Lite operations. So they forward to SQL Lite insert, delete, update, and query mechanisms. And those are actually synchronized internally. If you take a look at this website, it talks about SQL Lite and content provider thread safety and how that all works. So those mechanisms are, are handled automatically for you. So the basic rule of thumb to remember is if your content provider methods don't access any other state other than to forward or delegate to the underlying SQL Lite mechanisms, you probably don't have to worry about synchronizing them at all. So that's, that makes your life easier. But it's a subtle issue, and, and if you read this article, it'll explain why they did it the way they did. And the basic reason, of course, was to avoid having gratuitous overhead that's unnecessary most of the time. OK, so that's basically the overview of content providers. Believe me, there's a lot more to content providers than we covered. There's a lot more to SQL Lite than we covered. So we just kind of scratched the surface of this stuff. Any questions? All right, in this particular class, we've, the three things we've covered so far, so activities, services, and content providers, you'll have to know a little bit about activities. And you, you know a little bit about activities, like how to start them after doing the first map app assignment. We'll do a lot more stuff with concurrency in activities, so you get more experience with that. We'll do a lot of stuff with services. We'll do a lot of stuff with concurrency and communication in services and back and forth between activities. And we'll do some stuff with content providers.